So this is a shirt that I wear when I travel home from uh, being on a trip and away from home. And if you're listening and not watching, it's a black t-shirt. It has a pair of praying hands on it in white ink. And um, I haven't been able to wear this shirt in over three months now. My speaking trips were canceled. My conferences were canceled. My client meetings were canceled. Uh, And like many of you, I've been grounded. And uh, so the shirt hasn't been on. I wear this shirt. I typically put it on when I'm on my way home from a trip. As soon as I start my trip home, I put it on. If I'm not going to be in a hotel, I pack it in my computer bag. So the second my last obligation is over and the trip home begins, I change into this shirt. And it puts me in the mindset I want to be in. It reminds me to be grateful for the home that I have. It, it kind of matches my excitement for going back to the things that I value most, um, to things that are familiar, the things that make me feel uh, normal, the things that are just come as an accepted part of life. When we're in our homes, we don't think much. We just do. We just react. We just behave. And so I decided to wear the shirt today uh, for this special episode of the podcast um, to remind me that there is a lot that is familiar to other people, people of color, African Americans, that is too familiar, that isn't worth celebrating. It's actually the source of a lot of pain and a lot of injustice and a lot of racism. On um, May 25th, Minneapolis officer Derek Chauvin held George Floyd's face to the ground with his knee on his neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds until he died. And that reality, it's not that that just is an incident that happened that day. The reality that that caused that callous response, that callous treatment, of Mr. Floyd didn't just happen that day. That's just something that we actually saw that day and the world saw that day. Something that's all too familiar to African Americans. All too familiar is the elements of racism in our culture, the biases, the persecution, the... I don't know, what word can I even use? And I'm here today to do this episode. This is the first time I've ever spoken out about a race issue. But one thing that this situation has done for me is send me into a level of consideration that I've never been in before. As the event happened, as the murder happened, as the protests began, as I watched my hometown city, Philadelphia, go up in smoke in some ways and um, just be affected by the emotion and the pain that has really had a deep, deep root in racism and um, all the resulting things. And I'm not even talking about the people who have decided to, to be pro to loot and to riot. I'm not talking about those people. I mean, that was the result and that's why the cities are, you know, having trouble. But the the real core issue of racism in our country, I've been afraid to bring issues like this up and speak about them. And it's not because I'm a racist. If you don't know, I grew up in the city. I had lots of black friends. I had lots of white friends. I, my wife and I, you may not know, um, recently took in a foster son when he was two days old. And we're about to really go through with a fully with, I mean, I would say close on an adoption, but we're about to, you know, go through on a full adoption of my son who is half African-American. And now there's like this new awareness and perception that I have that, you know what? He is going to be treated differently because of that fact. And even so acknowledging that because he's got white parents, that that's going to help him out, actually. It's going to make things a little bit easier for him. And I've never really thought about it as deeply as I have through this situation. And I've been afraid 
to talk about these things openly. Not for a few reasons. I don't want people to think that I do it just because it's the cool thing to do. Right? I tend to, when, when people lean one way, I, I kind of lean the other way. It's not that. But really, there is a fear that I'm going to say or do something that would be hurtful or offensive to my African-American friends or people that I know or colleagues. And that fear, I've allowed that fear to keep my voice down on this issue. And I have learned the reality is that is the last thing I should do because squashing and suffocating racism in our country is the obligation of everyone. And I can only control me. And so as I say these things, I feel pensive about it for sure at the, at the risk of offending or so- sounding callous or at, at very best ignorant of the understanding of what, what effect they actually have, this racism has had, because I don't have the same experience, not even close. I don't have the same experience of being looked at by officers or pulled over when I shouldn't be or talked about in a certain way, in a certain tone, or having people clutch their purse a little tighter. I don't have any of those experiences, and I, and I won't. So I approach you today as a student. If you're of color, if you're a minority, if you're African American, I approach you as a student to try to learn and understand and grow in my empathy for how this has hurt and damaged and wounded you so that I can then be part of the solution, be part of the healing. And now I have an opportunity to have conversations with my children, to have conversations with my colleagues, to have conversations with you on how we can understand the problem. But if there's one thing I can do, it is to be transparent and open, open hands, open heart, and open willingness to squash and suffocate racism whenever, whenever I see it. It is my obligation as a business owner to build an organization that does the same thing. I care so deeply for my African-American friends. And in times like this, I feel there's a level of, I'll just say it, there's a level of guilt that overwhelms me because I feel like in some way I might be viewed as part of the problem. But I believe that my intent will come out in the end. I believe this is part of expressing my intent. So I come as a student. I don't know anything. I'm starting there in a new way more than ever before. My desire is to serve and love and be part of the healing. And I thought it was very important that I said that in this forum on all of my platforms so that maybe you can derive some encouragement or courage from it and join me just like I have derived that courage and encouragement from others. Together, we can make sure that the next 10 years are not like the last 10 years and we can teach our kids and we can move the ball forward. Let's not let Mr. Floyd's life go to waste and not just his life, but all the lives and all of the hurt and all the pain that has been endured doesn't have to be meaningless because in this moment, it can change us. And a lot of times in life, it's the painful things that change us for the better. Actually, most times in life. So I hope that you will join me in that. I talk about clarity on this podcast, clarity being perspective, understanding where we are in the journey. Well, here it is. We have a racist past as a country. There are good things as a country, but there's racism in there. We are walking toward a country where we eliminate the racism. We're somewhere in the middle right now. And the more empathy we have, the more we learn, the more we understand where we are on the path, the more we understand where we have to go in the future and understand the way forward. So thank you for letting me share this with you. Please reach out if you want to talk about it more, discuss it. How can we work together to suffocate the racism in our world and in our hearts and in our biases so that the familiar thing becomes a country without racism. Appreciate you guys. Pursue clarity.